Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if I cut the last one off too soon. So I just want to reiterate what I want you to try it for yourself. So open up a new code box and I just want to show you something. If you click on it, you can automatically say plus code or plus text. So to open a new code box, you can just do something like that. Then write addition, subtract and multiplication and division operations that each result in the number eight. Be sure to enclose your operations in a print statement to, to see the results. Okay, so like I said, I'm gonna suggest that you pause the video here on your own and make sure that you have it working properly. I'm gonna move on to the next. I'm just gonna have this as a streaming flow with you having the ability to stop and play around with things as you go along. I would strongly suggest try printing, you know, putting things into your own um, notebook and making sure that it works. Okay, Boolean values. So remember a Boolean value can take on one of two values. It's either going to be true or going to be false. Um, so in this case, what this is going to do is it's doing the test. Is one greater than two? The answer is false. So when you print the X, it's going to print out false, as opposed to Y is going to contain the value of is two greater than one, which is going to be true. So your comparison operators, right, are double equal sign. Remember the single equal sign, like you've seen here, is an assignment. The double equal sign is equal to, not equal to, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to, right? And this is as you expect, like two is equal to two, that would be a true. Two is not equal to three, that's true. Two is less than or equal to two, that's true because it's equal to, and two is greater than or equal to three, that would be a false. Um, then you have um, keywords and, or, and not, right? So an and will only be true if both are true. So A and B will only be true if both A and B are true or will only be true if one or the other is true um, and not reverses. So it turns true to false and false to true. Okay, so let's take a quick look at some examples. If we set X equal to true and Y equal to false, then my question here is saying X or Y, so if we evaluate X or Y, so true or false, is that equal to true? So hopefully you decide that true or false is true and true is equal to true. So printing out this will print true. What about X and Y? True and false is false. So is false equal to false? True. And this last one, not X. So X was true. So not X is false. Is false equal to true? That's false. Okay. So just like um, with PEMDAs, you also need um, an order of operations. So the order of operations is um, and takes precedence over or. So not and, and then or, that's the order of operations, okay? Um, so if, if that's the case, right? So if and, there's no not here. So and comes first and then or, right? So this would be, right? It, it rains and it's cold or windy. So if and takes precedence, it means it's, it rains and it's cold, or it's windy. If or took precedence, then it would be as though the parenthesis is here, which means that it rain, it rains and it's cold or windy. So since we're saying that and takes precedence, number one is how it would be interpreted. 
So let's see what that looks like, um, you know, when we're talking X and Y, right? So if I said X equal to true and Y equal to false, we're saying with that, right? So X is true and not Y. So not Y is not false is true. So X true and true is going to be true. So this first one is going to evaluate to true. Not X, which is going to be false, right? And so not true, which is false, and false is going to go to evaluate to false. False and false is false because both are not true. And this one is a little bit more complicated, but notice it's still all within parentheses. So the innermost parentheses is not X. So not true, this is false. So this here is false and false. So false and false is still false. So this parenthesis evaluates to false, but false or X, which is true. So false or true is going to evaluate to true, which means that this is all going to evaluate to true. So our first one was true, then false, then true. Now, um, this is a little bit more advanced, but what you need to know is that the following value that these all evaluate to false. So anything, the word none, which you'll learn about later, um, or a zero or a 0, 0.0 or anything that's empty. So an empty set of brackets, an empty set of um, curly brackets, or an empty set of quotes, all of these are going to evaluate to false. Okay, as opposed to any any character that is not one of those values is going to evaluate to true. So here, let's go, jump back up here. Here we're saying m is equal to two minus two, which means that m is equal to zero. So if m is equal to zero, print great one. So that's true, great. If zero, but we already said zero is false, right? So if zero is false, it's would, um, it's not going to get here. So this is saying if false, so it's not going to print grade two. And if M, M is equal to zero, so it's not going to print grade three. And then if, and we've already established that all these are false, so it's not going to print dead code. But if it's anything other than those, meaning if it's A or, right, this is the string A that's not an empty string or any other integer, it's going to print it as live code. Okay, give this a shot for yourself. Open up a new code box, create two variables, one that's set to true, one that's set to false, and pr print two conditions using both variables that is true, meaning that evaluates to true, and two that evaluate to false. So you can do that however you would like. Okay, on to the next type of a variable, which is a string. So a string is a series of characters. So anything inside quotes is a string. The five most common ways to create a string is either using a single quote, a double quote. You can even use a triple quote. Um, the one rule between these three is that whatever you put on one side, you have to put on the other side. So you can create something with a single quote on one side and a double quote on the other side. Um, the other thing that you should know is this triple quote allows you to put in multiple lines of code. Um, so those are the first three ways of creating. You can also use the string function. Remember we use the int function to create an int. Now you could use the string function which will take this number five and turn it into a string that has the value of five. And you can do a concatenation of two previous strings. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. Here I'm creating a variable called reaction. And inside that variable, I'm putting the string LOL and then I could print out reaction, and it's just going to print out LOL. Um, you can then change the value of a string. So now I'm changing the value of my string to meh, and I'm printing it out, okay? So once you change the value, it no longer holds the previous value. 
You can include quotes and apostrophes within your strings um, by interchanging double quotes and single quotes. Um, and then there's a concept of escaping a character. So first let's look at the interchange, right? So here, let's say you wanna put, you wanna print out a quote, right? So, um, you know what, give me one second. Instead of printing it all on one line, I'm going to print it separately on each line. So it'll become oops, a little bit more obvious. OK, so um, I'm creating line one, which what I want to do is I want to print out something that has quotes in one I'm printing out. And the way to do that, if you see my outer thing that's telling Python that's a string is the single quotes on either end. And because the single quotes are on the outside, therefore any quotations inside, it doesn't have to worry about treating it as a quote. So we could actually print out the quotes and you're seeing that in reverse here, right? So you can either use that as like, you know, to put quotes or <coughs> around a particular word or to use it as an apostrophe like you're seeing in this last one. In addition to that, you could use something called, an, <laughs> excuse me, an escape character. So the escape, what that backslash did, we saw it all the way up at the beginning when we used it within our comment to backslash the pound sign. So this is, um, the same here, right? So here, instead of backslashing the pound sign, I'm backslashing a quote. So all these things are going to, right, print out. So you're not really seeing last two. So let me just do. Right, so both of these are going to print in exactly the same way. I really. Um, I'll print one that way. And one that way. Okay. So this is actually showing you a couple of things. For starters, it's showing you that you can, um, here it's doing it the way we did it up here, which is that we're using the double, a mix of the double quote and the single quote to maintain that quote. And the other thing you're seeing here is you're seeing a string concatenation. You're taking this string and you're concatenating in that string. And notice there's no space between them because you're just concatenating the two. What I'm doing in this next one is I'm printing first and last two so that you can see that the escape is working. But now I'm not concatenating, I'm just printing it as two separate variables, and then you're going to see the name written now. The escape character could also be used to print out a tab, right, or a new line. So look at what's happening here, right? So um, what do you get if you say tornado, and notice this is a space followed by a tab. So you didn't actually need the space there. Okay, so here's how it's printing it out. It's printing out that tab. And then it's also printing out a tab over here, 10 times backwards and forward. And now I'm saying new line, and it's giving you a new line and printing out a tongue twister. Okay, so that just gives you some formatting options. There are many other um, options that you can do, um, which I'm not sure if we'll get into in this class, so you'll learn it in a subsequent Python class. There's some operations you can do on strings. You can concatenate two strings with a plus sign. You can multiply by a certain number. And right, so let's take a look at what happens. So if you concatenate two strings, like if you say five plus five, you're going to get 55, as opposed to if you have an integer plus an integer, right? Five plus five as integer is going to be giving you 10. You cannot add a string and a number. So if you try and add the string, like the quote five as a string, plus the five as a number, you're gonna get an error. 
So let's see that in practice, right? So here I'm taking, I'm putting number is five. String one is equal to the string 10. String two is equal to the string five. So this is one, here you're seeing another new function that you could do. And that is if you wanna double check the type of variable that you're dealing with, you could type in the word type. And that's what this is. This is the first print we're doing. So it's telling you that num, the variable num, is an int, is an integer, as opposed to the variable string is, I'm sorry, string one is a string. Now, here I'm concatenating two strings or I'm adding them together. So it's taking string two, which is the five, and adding and concatenating string one to it. So that's my 510. But in, if I if I try and run this, this is going to give me that error, right? So it's saying unsupported operand type for plus integer and string. So you can't run a plus on a combination of an integer and a string. Um, but notice what it's doing on, on this last one. So it's taking my string one, which is 10, and multiplying it by five. Um, and so what it's doing here is it's taking my string and repeating it and concatenating it to each other five times. So 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, five times. Okay, here's another two try yourselves. One, assign a message to a variable and then print, print that message. Then change the value of the variable to a new message and print the new message. So try that for yourself. And when you've completed that, go on and try this next one, which is write a Python commands that prints the following lines. The first one is, hi there, what a nice day. Print that on one line. And then after you're completed with that, print out hello. And then on the next line, print out world. OK, on to the next one, which is input from the user. Sometimes when you're writing code, it's good to be able to get input from the user, okay? And the way you do that is through the input function. Um, so it's going to display the text that you add between the parentheses and waits for the user to type something, okay? Um, so it will type it in, and then what you get back is always going to be a string. So let's go ahead and run that. So enter the hours, right? So let's say I say 10 hours, okay? It's not gonna do anything, you see this? It's waiting for a response. Now it's saying enter the rate. No, um, 15.5. Okay, so the next thing it's doing is what I want you to see is S hours and S rate, even though they're numbers that I typed in, input will always give you back a string. So if you want to um, use what's being entered as a number as a number, you have to type it to int. So here I'm saying, take the value that I put into s hours and type it to an int, and then multiply that by the value that I put into s rate and make it into a float. Multiply the two together and then put it into a new variable called gross pay and then print out gross pay and print out the type of gross pay. So now because I have an int and a float, my gross pay is going to be a float. And that's what you're seeing here. Um, so uh, in this initial class, I'm not gonna teach you how to write functions, but I am going to teach you some basic functions that are, um, applicable to individual variable types. So we've done a couple of like generic functions. You've seen print, right? You've seen int, you've seen float, you've seen str, you've seen abs for absolute value. But now you're gonna see it's a slightly different type of function because it's associated with a string. And the way that you identify it is by having the what's called the dot notation. So if I have name as a string and I have name dot title, so this indicates to me that there is a method called title that is associated with a string. Every method is followed by a set of parentheses. 
sometimes the parentheses will have a value in it or will have a parameter that's passed into that function. So, um, so the first one we're going to look at is the title function. And what the title function does is it puts the first letter to title case. Okay, so let's go ahead and run that. So um, here we're creating a variable name and we're assigning a string out of Lovelace to that variable name. Then we're, I'm gonna create a new variable to call title name where I'm gonna run the title function on my string. And then I'm printing out title name. And notice title, not only does it capitalize the first letter, but it capitalizes the first letter of every word. So both Ada and Lovelace have capital letters starting it. As opposed to if I take name and instead of running title as my function, I run capitalize on my function, it's just going to change the first letter to my work, my whole string to a capital. And that's what you're seeing here. Ada gets a capital A, but Lovelace does not get a capital L. Here are a couple of more um, functions. One is lowercase, which as you can imagine, it takes the string and it changes all letters within the string to lowercase. And that's what you're seeing as the output here. Um, you can do that either right here, temp is a variable. So you could either do it on a variable or you could just type in a string right there and say lower, and then it will do that. In addition to lowercase, you can also do uppercase. Right, so that's going to take whatever string you're passing in and turn it all to uppercase letters. And then just for fun, you could do swap case, which will take what was previously a lowercase, make it an uppercase, and what was previously an uppercase, and make it a lowercase. And that's what you're seeing here. Um, there's strip can remove white spaces, and a white space could be just you know, a plain space, it could be a tab and it could be a new space. So remember the slash T is a tab, the slash N is a new. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting Y equal to um, a number of spaces, the string, this is lazy, then a tab, a new line, and a number more spaces. So when I print out Y, you're seeing all this extra white space, including this new line here that just has some white space on it. So um, what you're printing out here, so this before strip, that's just so that you can see the difference between the top and the bottom. Now what I'm doing is I'm running the strip function on it and then I'm printing it out. So now notice there's no more space at the beginning and there's no more space at the end, including no new line down at the bottom. Um, then there are some string methods that return, so, so far, all of these that you've seen, they've returned strings to you. Now you can see string methods that return a true or a false. So it's a Boolean operation. So here, the function that I'm looking with is starts with. So the parameter that I'm passing in here is smart. So does my string, not a smartphone, start with the word smart? So that you would assume would return a false as opposed to ends with. So does my string smartphone end with the word phone? That's a true. And the other one is in, which will return true if, um, if there is the word ear contained somewhere in earth. So I can say, right, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be the beginning, right? So it could be R. Is R in Earth? And the answer is still true. So I just, there are a lot of other string methods. Um, the purpose of this is really to just get you started in Python and get you a little bit comfortable with it without, you know, stressing it to the end. Um, I can give you some resources if you want to look beyond what I'm covering within this class. 
Okay, the next thing that I'm gonna have you um, learn about is lists. So a list is a container variable. And what I mean by a container variable, it could store multiple values that you could both put into a list and access from a list. Um, the way it's you the way you create a list is you put the values comma separated within square brackets. Um, you can think of right of a um, a list as being like a row of boxes the way each box contains a value and you can access each box based upon something called an index. So the index starts with zero. So that's something that you're going to have to remember. It starts with a zero, not a one. So the number one as an index actually refers to the second position within your list. Um, and you can use an index to either get information from the list or to change a value of the list. So let's take a, a quick look at this example here, right? So here I'm creating my list. Notice there are square brackets on either end, comma separated values. So the first index or index zero is going to be the string apples, then the string bananas, the string grapes, oranges, and pears. And if I print out fruits and then notice the square brackets, I'm saying, give me the first, the value that's in the first index. So this is the zeroth. And this is one. And so what's going to print out is fruits sub one, which is bananas. Um, you can access a group of the list, right? So you're going to go with the starting index and it goes to an ending index. What you need to be note and be aware of is the fact that the starting index is inclusive, meaning it starts with one. The ending index is exclusive. So it goes up to, but not including. So fruits one to four will say, start with one, go two, go three, up until four, but don't include four. So you really, you're just printing out one, two, and three. And that's what you should see. Oops, well, I have to run that first. I can run that, right? So um, my, whole fruits list is apple, bananas, grapes, oranges, and pears. One to four start in the first index, second index, the third index, up to but not including my fourth index. It's going to take a little while for you to get used to that concept of starting. The two points that you're going to need to remember from this is that you start with zero and that the when you're identifying two, um, a starting and an ending, it goes up to, but not including the ending index. When you want to modify a list, meaning, so a modification to a list means that you are replacing the value of a list. Okay, so let's go through. There's a couple of different things that we're going to be looking at. These are functions that, so some of this is functions that you're running and some of it is just you're updating a value in a list. So this first one is we are just replacing a value of list. And so what you're saying is um, fruits sum two. So the index of two should now have kiwi. And so after replace, that's what it's gonna look like. It's gonna take zero, one, two, put kiwi into two. Then just like string had dot methods that you could run on it, so too list has dot methods that you could run on it. The first one is append. The first one that we're going to cover is append. And notice, um, even though other times when you're dealing with a list, you use square brackets, now you're dealing with a function. And the function is always going to have the parentheses. So I'm saying append cherries, the string cherries, on to the end. So append always adds to the end of my fruits list. Okay. So now I have my previous value of list, notice kiwi is still there, and now it's appended cherries onto the end of the list. You can also insert, and what insert does is it will, you can define a place within your list that you want to do the insertion. So here I'm saying in at index two, 
add the, the value peaches. So now zero, one, two is gonna be peaches and everything else is going to be moved over one space. You could remove a value from the list, right? So now I'm saying remove Kiwi. Um, so now I have, this is after remove. So I have my entire list here and notice Kiwi is no longer in my list of fruits. Um, you can sort the list, right? So, and sort actually changes the order of the list itself. So sort does, will sort in an alphanumeric order, right? So now I have it in this order and reverse takes the list and puts it in reverse order. So notice this was the order of my list and now I have my order reversed. Um, you can also have something called an inner list. So a list can contain other lists, okay? So what this is, is that this is part of your outer list. So I have A, B, C, then my, by my index three or my fourth position, I have a list. So this is an inner list, and then this is one for an outer list. So in my outer list, I have one, two, three, four, five values. Amongst those five values is a an inner list. Then my inner list itself has three values. So let's take a look at what that was looked like, right? So here I have um, fruits with inner, right? So my inner list is different kind of apples. So I have bananas, right? So my fruit inner is going to be, how many spaces are gonna be? So it's one, then this whole list is two, then three, four, five. So fruits inner has five values or five elements to it. Um, then I can, if I ref if I print out, um, huh. notice it's case sensitive with let's try that again. Okay, so what I'm printing out here is I'm saying, okay, I've created here, I'm creating my list, and now I'm printing out index one. So index one here, this is index zero, and then this whole thing here is index one, okay? And that's what's printing out. You can access a specific, um, value within your inner list. So here what I'm saying is from my first index, right, which is this whole list, give me back what's in the zero with index position. So it's saying within this entire list, I have a value here and gala is the zero with position in my inner list. And that's what you're seeing here. Um, Okay, I'm gonna pause here because what I really wanted to do was give you another exercise to do. Um, so I will come back and you'll have an exercise to do.